Velme šanovni panji i panove, drogi člene naukovo tovarstva imene Ševčenka, dobri večer, Hristos Voskres, da teh, što mene ne znaju, ja nazivaju še Darija Darević i ja je holovoju naukovo tovarstva imene Ševčenka v Kanadji, to mu ja imaju veliko prijemnišč in povedanišč privitati vših vas še hodni večerom na naši trgovi dopoliti. Osoblevo vitaju našoho šanovnjo dopritača doktora Tomasa Prejmaka, disnoho člena tovarstva, vitaju joho z vedanjem joho najnovišji knjiški Gathering a Heritage, Ukrainian, Slavonic and Ethnic Canada and the USA, se je vedanje University of Toronto Press z menulho roku. Naše tovarstvo nadalo finansovo dopomogo na ce vedanja v ramkah vedavnečeho grantu naukovo tovarstvo imene Ševčenka na naukovi prači. Knežku možno zakupiti tišlja dopovidi v foje in takož vejemkovo, če dopovid bude angliško jumovoju, diskusija može biti v obedvoh novah jak komu zručnijše. Takož hoču privitati šanovnu panju Olgu Kuplovšku, direktora Fundaciji ukrajinskih studij. Fundacija takož nadala financovo dopomogu na vedanje knjiške. Zaraz pišlja dopovidi, vid budiča korotka prezentacija knjiške obom našim organizacijama. Koristaju znahodi in zaprošuju vših vas na našu nastupnu dopovid, odnoho z naših členjiv, znavča Osmanjškoji imperiji in doslednika istorije Kremu, profesora Viktora Ostapčuka. Dopovid vid budiča v pjatniču 29. travnja o hodeni šoma treče večerom v galeriji Kum. Tema dopovidi doktora Ostapčuka Krem 2014. roku v bezodni rosejšku izslave, znak za petanje, Krajmija 2014, in the abyss of Russian glory. Se bude perehljat ta očinka podi zvjazanih s hopljenjem ta aneksije v Kremu v lutomu berezni menulho roku, ta sprobe peretvoreti piv ostriv nevidemnu častenu Rusiji. Što nam vidimo, teper ta je ki perspektive rozvedsko podi v konteksti Ukrajine, Rosiji, ta švitu. Tema, aktualna in čikava, ja še raz zaprošuju vših priti. Do predstavljanja šanovnoho dopovitača in prevedenja večera, ja poprošu disnoho člena naukovo tovarstva imene Ševčenka, vidimoho istorika, profesora Franka Cesar. Ok, prvi, kaj se vidite v vrhu? Kaj se vidite vrhu? Ok, tako je vrhu mikrofon vrhu 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 vrhu. Kaj se vidite vrhu 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 one of the leading historians of Ukraine, and particularly Ukrainian intellectual history, uh, but uh, as well a historian who began his career by studying the Cistercian order in the Third Crusade. That is, Tom Primak could have become a medieval historian. Uh, he now uh, does not uh, claim fluent Latin, uh, but uh, reading of Latin, uh, I'm sure had he gone in that direction, uh, Latin and not Ukrainian and Polish uh, would have taken over his life and he might would have had, I think, a very different career uh, than he has had. Uh, the uh, uh, Tom uh, represents uh, the generation of the descendants of the pioneers uh, on the prairie, uh, the group groups that established Ukrainian community life uh, and comes from uh, the 
great capital of at least pre-World War II Ukrainian Canada, uh, Winnipeg. His associations with the city are very strong. I'm sure they're going to appear uh, in uh, this discussion today. Uh, and it is at uh, the University of Manitoba uh, that he gave the Cistercians a twirl. Uh, fortunately uh, for us, uh, he uh, then, when embarking on doctoral studies, uh, came to the University of Toronto, uh, worked with the eminent specialist of Polish history, uh, Peter Brock, uh, and turned his attention instead to Ukrainian intellectual history. Uh, he worked on the major figures of the 19th and early 20th century. We will be hearing about his uh, travails, uh, works, uh, and reflections on Drushevsky, but we must remember that uh, uh, his monograph on Kostomarov uh, was groundbreaking and written at a time when the literature uh, on uh, not only Ukrainian intellectual history, uh, but also uh, Ukrainian 19th century history was rather limited. Uh, but throughout uh, his development as a historian uh, and his teaching at many universities, Toronto, McMaster's, uh, Saskatchewan, uh, he always kept his uh, feet firmly on the Canadian ground. Uh, that is, uh, he had a great interest in uh, the history of the Ukrainian community and its development. As we know, he has had many interesting discoveries in that, that, that field. Uh, uh, all of us who know about his work on Gabriel Roy and how he, uh, he solved problems unknown to many specialists of uh, Quebecois or Franco-Canadian history, know the, the kind of contributions he has made to that field. Uh, although he proudly, as far as proudly, uh, announces himself as a pacifist, uh, he has also contributed greatly to the study of uh, Ukrainian Canadians during World War II with a major monograph in that field. Uh, he has uh, gathered uh, together uh, his heritage and our heritage. Uh, in the volume we'll be hearing more about, uh, 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 more about today. Uh, but uh, before we turn to that, I think we also have to say that Tom has been remarkably active and determined to pursue his vocation. Uh, that is, his vocation as a historian, uh, as a Ukrainian Canadian. Uh, he has worked thanks uh, closely with the many institutions here in Toronto that deal with Ukrainian studies. We had the great fortune uh, for that for many years. He was our book review editor of the Journal of Ukrainian Studies. I see Professor Magoji is here and can also tell us about Tom as a research associate of the Chair uh, of Ukrainian Studies. Uh, and uh, uh, within that, although not uh, having what might be called the usual academic trajectory, uh, he, because of a devoted wife and family uh, who believed in what he was, what he was doing, uh, was able to make a remarkable, a remarkable uh, accomplishment uh, in the examination of many, many facets of Ukrainian and East European and Canadian history. And uh, today, he will address us, and, I, and of course I have to read this title because my memory does not enable me to have, get all of it, Mikhailo Grushevsky Scholarship in the 1980s, Ukrainian Books, Libraries, and Archives in the West during the Long Cold War, and I would add, and before the initiation of the Ruszewski Translation Project. <laughs> President Obama. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sisson. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good to be back here. Yes, so to, this evening I will be talking about Mikhailo Ruszewski, uh, who, of course, needs no introduction to most of you, great Ukrainian historian that he was. Uh, this particular paper will describe the research that I did on Ruszewski uh, in the 1980s, in the early 1980s, before there was any thought of perestroika or anything like that, and certainly no thought of 
of uh, independent Ukraine just around the corner. So it's kind of like a memoir, an academic memoir. I have always been interested in history, and even during my first years in graduate school at the University of Manitoba, I paid some attention to my East European background, doing several essays on Russian subjects for a general course on 19th century Europe under Professor Michael Kinnear at the Fort Garry campus of the university. But it was only after the completion of my MA thesis on the medieval crusades to the Holy Land, on the Cistercian order in particular, that I firmly decided to turn to the Slavic world and take up the serious study of Eastern Europe. Now the question immediately arose, if I were to do a PhD in Russian or Ukrainian history, where was the best place to study? At that time, Ukrainian history was still widely regarded in the West as a sub-discipline of Russian and Soviet history, and specialists in Ukrainian history, which for the most part was my particular interest, were few and far between. The principal centers for the study of Ukrainian history in North America were then Harvard University in the United States, where a medievalist with Oriental interests, Omilyan Pritsak, held the Mikhail Ruzhevsky Chair of Ukrainian History, and the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Western Canada, where Ivan Lysiak Rudnitsky, a historian of political thought, was teaching. At my alma mater, the University of Manitoba, there were actually two Ukrainian historians on staff. Oli Garris, only recently hired, who specialized in the modern period, and the Reverend Alexander Baran, who did the Cossack era. But I had already received two degrees from that university, and I thought it necessary to expand my horizons somewhat by studying elsewhere for my next degree. At the University of Toronto, then Canada's most prestigious university, where I had already done some work towards a PhD in medieval history, there was a respectable contingent of Russian historians, John Keep, Harvey Dick, and Andy Rossos, and also a well-respected Polish historian, Peter Brock, but no specialist in Ukrainian history. Nevertheless, I had family contacts in Toronto, and I already had some experience with the university there. And so I decided to retrain myself as a Slavist and Russian historian at that particular institution. In 1975, I enrolled as a special student in East European Studies, and in 1977 as a PhD student in Russian and East European History at the University of Toronto. By 1980, I had completed my coursework, passed my uh, comprehensive exams, and was considering various topics upon which to write a thesis. The choice of a thesis topic would also determine who my faculty advisor would be, as Dick handled Muscovy and the uh, 18th century Russia, Keep handled the 19th century and Soviet Russia, Rossos did Russian foreign policy, and Brock covered all of Eastern Europe, north of the Balkans, and west of Russia proper. For some time, I considered doing something on older Ukraine, perhaps on the Cossacks, with Dick as my food supervisor but I discovered that I had profound differences with him on certain very important uh, themes in Ukrainian history, and that would just not do. Thereafter, the choice of writing on the great Ukrainian historian and political leader, Mikhailo Ruzhevsky, actually came quite easily. I wanted to work on an important subject, and I had always been interested in biography, the personal in history, of the people who were then considered to be the three greatest uh, figures of modern Ukraine, Taras Shevchenko, the poet, the historian Ruszewski, and the West Ukrainian leader Ivan Franko. Shevchenko was already the subject of a first-rate biography written by Pavlo Zaitsev in interwar Poland and published in the West in 1955. <coughs> and Franko, like Shevchenko before him, was more important as a literary than a historical figure. At that time, I was not much of a literary scholar. This left Ruszewski an outstanding historian and an important political figure. It might, he might be, I hoped, a man that I could understand. Moreover, there was at that time almost no full-length book on him in any language, including Ukrainian, and rumors and accusations of various kinds swirled about him, some of these very, very uh, derogatory. 
My choice was self-evident. I set about to write a political biography of Mikhail Rushevsky. I was concerned, however, that I would not be able to find sufficient primary materials about Rushevsky in Western libraries, archives, and repositories. Soviet assistance on such a politically sensitive subject was inconceivable, as Rushevsky, who in the West symbolized Ukrainian national independence, was definitely persona non grata in the USSR. With this question in mind, I wrote to Ivan Misakrudnitsky and asked him about the feasibility of undertaking such a study. There we go. Rudnitsky replied that he was certain that a book such as the one that I had in mind was entirely possible, and that, in fact, it was simply a scholarly scandal, Naukovi Skandal, that nothing of significance had already been published about Rushevsky. This was in 1980. Who had actually led Ukraine to political independence during the revolution of 1917 to 18, and died under mysterious circumstances in Stalin's Soviet Union. Professor Brock, who had done a bit of work on the Ukrainians in old Austrian Galicia, on the 19th century Ruthenian national awaker Ivan Wahalevich, to be exact, happily agreed to supervise a thesis on Grzeszewski, and I immediately set to work. <coughs> I began by gathering and examining some scattered bits and pieces interpretive essays and synthetic treatments, which had been published in Western countries in the decades after the Second World War. Curiously enough, the first such essay that I read was Omelian Pritzak's commemoration piece titled On the Centenary of the Birth of Mikhail Vrushevsky. This controversial <coughs> essay was very critical of Vrushevsky and attacked what he called his populist socialist approach to both politics and history from a very conservative Hetmanite point of view. The Hetman, or monarch, Pavlo Skoropadsky, had overthrown Rushevsky's socialist central Rada government in a coup d'etat during the revolution of 1917 to 18. It was surprising to me that such an attack on Rushevsky could even be published as a commemorative work. I could not quite understand how the holder of the Mikhail Rushevsky chair of Ukrainian history at Harvard University could entertain such a critical position on the great historian. On the other hand, I was relieved and delighted that Rushevsky was turning out to be a socialist and a radical democrat rather than a rightist nationalist, as this corresponded to some degree with my own political convictions of the time. In my opinion, this made him a much easier man to work on. After examining Hrushevsky's rather startling introduction to the great historian's life, I picked up the small but important collection of his political writings published by Mikola Khali and a group of emigre Ukrainian socialists in New York in 1960. This collection contained many of the historian's political tract produced during the revolution. These included his influential essay, Yakoi me hochimo autonomi i federatsi, what kind of autonomy and federation we want, and parts of the collection titled Vilna Ukraina, Free Ukraine, which set forth his idea that at that time, the best geo and I stress at that time, the best geopolitical arrangement for Ukraine would be a wide national autonomy approaching complete independence. The Hali collection also included his rather thorough tract Naporozy Novoy Ukraine, on the threshold of a new Ukraine, which went beyond autonomy and considered the ideal principles and structure of the independent and democratic <coughs> Ukraine that had actually emerged out of the chaos of the revolution. The slogan, Vilna Ukraina, was a leitmotif of the early, most hopeful stage of the Ukrainian revolution. But Khrushchevsky, for a time at least, considered the latter essay to be his political <coughs> testament to later generations of Ukrainians. I immediately became an admirer of the Vilna Ukraina mentality, and thereafter always preferred it to the Slava Ukraini slogan, slogan, which arose later, later on, and became the cry of the 1940s nationalists. Moreover, I found that the general introduction to Holly's volume by Volodymyr Doroshenko a former member of the Ukrainian Social Democratic Workers' Party, 
a librarian at the Shevchenko Scientific Society in Lviv between the wars, and thereafter an emigre in New York, was particularly sympathetic and valuable. Volodymyr Duroshenko had known Hrushevsky personally and was politically close to him. I later discovered that in the 1950s, this same Doroshenko had published a whole series of biographical articles on Hrushevsky in the American Ukrainian language magazine, Ovid. These articles were of special help to me in piecing together the various parts of Hrushevsky's long and very productive political career, as well as his enormous contribution to Ukrainian scholarship. Once again, Hrushevsky's position as a democratic socialist and a radical democrat came out very clearly in Volodymyr Doroshenko's interpretation of the great historian. Once I had put together a general outline of Hrushevsky's scholarly and political career, I turned to the journal of the Ukrainian Historical Association, Ukrainsky Historic, Ukrainian Historian. This journal was edited by Lubomir Vinar of Kent State University in Ohio, and it contained a great variety of materials about Hrushevsky. Benar and his associates had made a special point of publishing primary documentation, audio autobiographical notes, letters, memoirs, research articles by or about Hrushevsky. All of this was geared to provide primary material for some future biographer. The work had been progressing steadily since 1966, on the occasion of the centenary of the historian's birth, when an entire issue of the journal had been devoted to him. This centenary volume contained articles and materials by Ukrainian emigre authors from all over the Western world. Besides Benar, contributors included Alexander Oklovlin, Ilya Vetanovich, Vasil Dubrovsky, and many, many others. Some of these authors had met Hrushevsky earlier in their careers, and one in particular, Boris Martos, had actually been a member of the Ukrainian Central Rada during the revolution. In contrast to Mikola Kholi's group, of Ukrainian socialists in New York, however, the contributors to Ukrainsky Historic, especially Benar himself, breathe the considerably more conservative, or perhaps one should say nationalist spirit, and usually stressed what they believe to have been the historian's contribution to Ukrainian state building. <coughs> From Benar's point of view, this was progress, since the more extreme 1930s nationalists had usually completely rejected Hrushevsky as a soft humanitarian socialist and even a pacifist, who, they claimed, disbanded the Ukrainian army when it was most needed <coughs> during the revolution. But Vinar and his colleagues, in their attempt to make Hrushevsky more acceptable to the nationalist viewpoint, or national viewpoint, as Vinar would have it, tended to play down his convictions as a radical democrat and a socialist. Thus, in general, I was quickly finding that materials by and about Khrushchevsky, although very scattered and quite contradictory, were abundant indeed. This discovery was confirmed when Alexander, when, excuse me, Andrew Gregorovich, a librarian at the University of Toronto, who had a long-standing interest in Khrushchevsky, his father had actually corresponded with him in the 1920s and sold his books in towns and, and cities across the the prairies in Western Canada. Uh, Grigorovich put his personal file of Hrushevsky materials at, at my dis disposal. This substantial file contained news cl clippings, journal articles, photographs, and Hrushevsky's unpublished correspondence with Grigorovich's father. It also contained Grigorovich's own reprint of Hrushevsky's brief but valuable autobiography, which had first been published in Lviv in 1906. Gregorovich had personally run this, bibli bibli this bibliography, this booklet, off a printing machine while he was a student, and he published it in 1965 under the auspices of the Ukrainian-Canadian Students' Union, SUSK, of which he had been an active member. My work was thus making swift and steady progress. At this point, Roman Senkus, the editor of the Toronto-based Journal of Ukrainian Studies, asked me to review a new commemorative volume devoted to Hrushevsky, which had just been published by the Shevchenko Scientific Society in New York City. This volume, which was largely devoted to Hrushevsky's last years in Soviet Ukraine, was edited by Matvi Stahi, a democratic socialist and former member of the Radical Party in interwar Galicia. 
who emigrated to the United States after the Second World War, and for many years edited the labor-oriented newspaper Narod Navolya, The People's Will, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where a large number of Ukrainian Americans of the older economic immigration still lived. I use this opportunity to synthesize my thoughts and current research on Ruszewski and outline the historical, historiographical debate among Ukrainian scholars concerning his person. This debate revolved around the idea of whether Ruszewski had remained a populist, Narodnik, with federalist ideals throughout his life, a position taken by conservatives and radical nationalists who accuse him of writing biased history and ruining the chances for the survival of an independent Ukrainian state during the revolution, or whether he had evolved into a true partisan of independent statehood, Derzhavnik, who had written inspired history and guided the Ukrainian People's Republic wisely during the brief period of its existence, a position held by his democratic socialist admirers. I saw some merit to both points of view. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Robarts Library at the University of Toronto. Most of my work on Mikhail Ruszewski's biography was carried out at the Robarts Library, the main humanitarian research library at that university, and the primary university uh, research library in Canada, in my humble opinion. The building which houses this institution is some 14 stories high. There is no doubt whatsoever that in the 1980s, this library held the largest collection of Ukrainica in the country. And with the possible exception of the University of Alberta Library in Edmonton, which is home to the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, at that time was the best place in Canada to carry on advanced work in this particular field. A detailed uh, catalogue of its Ukrainian holdings was published in the mid-1980s and fills two very stout volumes. The University of Toronto collection of Ukrainian materials was built up almost entirely after the Second World War. The compilation of this collection had followed the establishment of a Department of Slavic Studies at the University in 1949 and progressed quite rapidly. The contributions of Ukrainian librarians on the Robarts <coughs> Library staff, such as Bohdan Budarovich, Vasil Vareha, Andrew Grigorovich, and Lupa Pense, were particularly notable. A librarian of Russian Dukabor ancestry, Mary Stevens, also made a, a significant contribution to the field. Later on, the establishment of a chair of Ukrainian studies in the departments of history and political economy, and the appointment of Professor Paul Robert Mogachi to hold this chair further improved the situation. But my work at the university was already well progressed by the time this chair was starting its activities, and I remained under the supervision of Peter Brock, under whom I had started my project. Soviet Ukrainian publications of the 1920s, when Hrushevsky was active in Kiev, were quite important for the completion of my project. In the early 1980s, the Robarts Library already had a very full collection of serials from the 1920s. Uh, from the 1920s Pan-Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. I think that there's a there's an error in the literature here. This is always the Seukrainska Akademia Nauk, you know. Um, it's usually translated as all Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. In my opinion, this is an error. It wasn't the all Ukrainian, because in English it just doesn't sound right, you know. But Pan-Ukrainian does, especially when you look into the idea of why it was founded was founded to serve all the Ukrainian people, not just in the Soviet Union, but all over Europe, outside the boundaries as well. So therefore, pan makes more sense than all, in my particular opinion. Most of these journals and periodicals were actually in the hard original, uh, original hardcover book editions rather than microform copies, which is more common in North American university libraries. The journal Ukraina, which was edited in Kiev by Hrushevsky himself until his exile from Ukraine in 1931, was of particular interest to me, and I was able to use a few volumes in hardcover and the rest in microform. Other important materials from Kiev that I used in microform include the Zapiski of the Kiev-based pre-revolution Ukrainian Scientific Society and other such institutions. <coughs> 
The Society Journal contained a rather full memoir by Hrushevsky about his scholarly memoir, mentor, Volodymyr Antonovich, who was professor of history at the University of Kiev. Similarly, the Robarts Library possessed very full collections in microform or hard cover copy of major Ukrainian periodicals from pre-World War I Lviv, including publications established or built up by Hrushevsky himself, such as the scholarly Zapisky of the, of the Shevchenko Soci Scientific Society and the literary view, lit review Literaturno Novkovi Visnik, in which the historian published extensively. I also made good use of the important Lviv newspaper, Dialov, the collection of pre-1914 uh, Galician uh, Ukrainian periodicals in microphone in Robarts is presently almost complete. Since in 1983, when I was completing my work on Khrushchevsky, the chair of Ukrainian studies acquired full or nearly complete runs of some 175 newspapers and journals of Western U Ukrainian origin. These were obtained from the Austrian National Library in Vienna. Most of my work on Hrushevsky, however, was done on the basis of the law and other periodicals that the library had possessed prior to 1983. Somewhat more typically, the Roberts Library had a very full collection of Ukrainian emigre journals and magazines published in the West since 1945. These included the journal Suchasnist, the present, which was particularly disliked by the Soviets. A very important article by Volodymyr Doroshenko on the mutual relations between Hrushevsky and Ivan Franko had appeared in the early 1960s in Suchasnist, and an article by Benar on the bibliographical problems of working on Hrushevsky appeared in the Jubilee year 1966. For many years, in fact, Suchasnist had the reputation of being the most substantial and varied Ukrainian periodical published in the West. Its prestige was firmly established outside of Ukrainian circles by the fact that it reflected a general democratic point of view, while including various shades of opinion from liberal to conservative within its circle of contributors. It was widely rumored at the time that the CIA secretly funded Suchasnist, though I was unaware of this when I began to use the journal. Other important Ukrainian emigre journals in the Robarts Library included Kiev, published in Philadelphia, and Liste do Priatoli, published in New York City. Both of these journals were more or less non-partisan, criticized the Ukrainian emigre establishment, and flourished during the early 1960s. Even more important for research on Hrushevsky was Novi Dni, a non-partisan monthly magazine published in Toronto by emigres from eastern Ukraine. This magazine contained an important memoir by Yevhenia Krychevska on the bombardment and destruction of Hrushevsky's great house and private library in Kiev during the revolution, and a number of smaller articles on Hrushevsky's place in Ukrainian history. Unlike Kiev and Liste du Priatoli, however, Novaini continued to appear throughout the 1970s and 1980s. It only ceased publication in the late 1990s that is, some time after communism collapsed and Ukraine became an independent state. At that time as well, the Robarts Library had a very full collection of two important Western European Ukrainian journals that contained materials on Hrushevsky. Firstly, there was Ukraina, published in Paris by the emigre Ukrainian socialist Ilko Borschak, who had personally known and corresponded with the historian. This modest magazine, which flourished during the 1940s and 1950s, represented a Francophile liberal democratic viewpoint, but also contained materials from other viewpoints. I should note here as well that there was a, a, a rumor about Borschak that I heard through um, George Lutsky many years later, that Borschak was a Soviet agent of sorts. Uh, how this could be when Borschak devoted his entire life to, uh, uh, to writing about Ukrainian cultural and political independence, I don't understand, but there was actually a rumor to that effect. Most interesting for my purposes were the memoristic accounts of Natalia Polonska Vasilenko, which described in detail the conflict between Hrushevsky and the Orientalist academician Ahatan Halkrimsky, 
at the Pan-Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in Kiev during the 1920s. Secondly, the Robarts Library had a very full collection of the journal Des Volny Schlag, published in London, England in the later 1940s, from the 1940s. This latter journal, which reflected the rightist opinions of the Bandera faction of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, was not sympathetic to Khrushchevsky's liberal humanitarian ideas. But in 1967, did publish a significant article by Bohdan Budorovich about the interpretation of Khrushchevsky found in Western reference works and encyclopedias. Budorovich then taught at the, in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Toronto and eventually sat on my thesis examination committee. At this point, mention should be made of the most important memoir literature about Khrushchevsky. Even then, most of this literature was easily available in the Robarts Library, or in any important Ukrainian library uh, collection in the West. For the early years, that is, the years prior to Khrushchevsky's move to Lviv and before the revolution, the voluminous memoirs of Alexander Lototsky were very important. Lototsky, an Orthodox theological student, knew Khrushchevsky as a fellow student in Kiev in the 1890s and was present at his master's thesis defense. He also shared many of his liberal democratic ideals. He lived and worked as an emigre scholar in Poland between the two wars. After Khrushchevsky moved from Kiev in the Russian Empire to Lviv in Austrian Galicia, certain other memoirs become very important. Of these, the most significant is probably Ivan Makuch, a Galician radical who personally knew Ivan Franco, lived through the period of political formation in Galicia in the 1890s, and was able to recall and explain Khrushchevsky's place in this process, and it was significant. The editorial notes by Matvi Stahiv to this substantial volume were also quite useful to me. Also important for the early years are the memoirs of Dmitro Doroshenko, no relation to Volodymyr. Later, Dean of Ukrainian emigre historians, whose testimony is very valuable for the period of the revolution of 1905, and Rushevsky's visits from Galicia to St. Petersburg during the Duma period. Although this Doroshenko, unlike Volodymyr, was to accept a conservative hetmanite or monarchist position during the revolution, his memoirs are quite open-minded and acknowledged that Rushevsky was universally respected among Ukrainian activists and sympathizers before 1917. It was only during the course of the revolution itself, when Rushevsky's radical opinions became more self-evident, that more conservative Ukrainians began to turn against him. For the period of the 1917 revolution itself, Dmitro Doroshenko is once again one of our principal informants. Although his conservative viewpoint emerges more clearly as the years pass by, although the, 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 the viewpoint emerges more clearly as the years pass by. To the end of his life, Dmitro Doroshenko returned a, uh, retained a certain respect for Hrushevsky and never cut off relations with his more liberal democratic colleagues. Of equal importance for the revolutionary period are the memoirs of the socialist revolutionaries, Mikola Kobolevsky and Nikifor Frihoryu, both of whom were well informed as to the events and maneuverings within the democratic socialist camp and Hrushevsky's place in these maneuverings. For the years that Hrushevsky spent in emigration, no single memoirist stands out. However, for the following period, that is the period from 1924 to 1934, which he spent in the Soviet Union, it is necessary to mention the highly personal history of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, written by the Ukrainian emigre historian working at the Ukrainian Free University in Germany, Natalia Polonska Vasilenko. Khrushchevsky plays a very important role in the first volume of this history, but Polonska Vasilenko's treatment of him is marred by her obvious antipathy to his person. During the revolution, her husband, Mykola Vasilenko, had supported the conservative headman, and later on, during the 1920s, she herself supported Krimsky's rival faction against Khrushchevsky's within the academy. Now, a few words about other Ukrainian collections here in Toronto in those days. Although the uh, Robarts Library at the university held the largest collection of Ukrainica in the city, there were several other collections that were of considerable use to me. 
In order of the value to me, of their value to me, these were the following. One, the St. Vladimir Institute Library, which was established support by supporters of the Ukrainian Greek Orthodox Church of Canada. Two, the Ukrainian National Federation Library, which was linked to the rightist nationalists in Europe from the 1930s. And three, the Library of the Ukrainian National Home, which had been founded during or shortly after the First World War and became associated with the Petlurist movement during the interwar period. Although it is the youngest in age, only established in the uh, early 1970s, the St. Vladimir Institute Library was the most valuable to me of the three above named institutions. The fact that it was located very close to the University of Toronto campus was significant. Not only was I able to loan books and journals from this library for extended periods of time and on more flexible terms than from the university, but I was also able to exchange duplicates with this institution and thus build up my own personal connection of Hrushevskiana. This was of considerable practical help to me in doing my major research project on the great historian. It was usually in copies from the St. Vladimir Institute Library on my home shelf that I examined the many articles, memoirs, and reviews concerning Grushevsky that I discovered scattered throughout the various volumes of Ukrainsky Historic. I turned to this material time and again during the course of my research. However, the St. Vladimir Institute Library also contained much material that the Robarts Library at that time did not have. And some of this material was very valuable to me in my work on Hrushevsky. The single most important item of this nature in the St. Vladimir collection was the journal Vilna Ukraina, published in the United States by a group of Ukrainian democratic socialists, former socialist revolutionaries and social democrats from revolutionary Ukraine, who as the title of their journals clearly revealed, greatly admired the life and ideals of Mikhail Hrushevsky. This group, which included Mykola Khali, who had edited the collection of Hrushevsky's political writings in the 1970s, was very prolific in his treatment of Hrushevsky and the Central Rada period of Ukrainian history, and criticized both the Bolsheviks and conservatives like Polonska Vasilenko and Dmitro Doroshenko for what they believed to be their slanted interpretations of these topics. Vilna Ukraina flourished during the 1950s in the 1960s, but declined thereafter as the veterans of the revolution slowly died off. The St. Vladimir Library contained other rare Ukrainian materials I was able to use. For example, there were many books and pamphlets, such as the memoir of Ivan Franko's daughter, Anna Franko Klutschko, who gave a picture of the relations between these two great figures of modern Ukraine. Franco Klitschko, who lived in Toronto during the post-war period, had a negative animus toward the historian and stressed the negative features of his personality. She claimed that Hrushevsky had overworked and greatly oppressed her father. Her story was later critically analyzed and corrected by Volodymyr Doroshenko in his article on the two men. The Library of the Ukrainian National Federation of Canada was the second important private Ukrainian library in Toronto, of which I made extensive use. This library was considerably older than the St. Vladimir Library and dated back to the period between the wars when its sponsoring organization, the Ukrainian National Federation, which was affiliated with the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN, in Europe, was quite vigorous. The UNF Library owned certain materials from between the wars which neither Robarts nor St. Vladimir's possessed, and much of this material had no ideological connection to the UNF. For example, the UNF Library had a very full collection of the serial titled Historichny Kalendar Almanac Chervonoi Kaline, which was published annually in Lviv during the 1930s. This almanac contains several articles of me that were, that were valuable to me, and from its pages I produced, I reproduced two illustrations from of, about the revolution of 1917 to 18. One of these was the photograph taken of Hrushevsky's great house in Kiev after its destruction by Muropyov. Another interesting serial in the UNF library was Vilna Spilka, a periodical published by Hrushevsky's socialist colleagues in Prague during the emigration period. 
In this title, Makita Shapoval published a valuable synthesis of the history of the Ukrainian socialist revolutionary movement during the revolution and paid considerable attention to his rival, Hrushevsky. And Hrushevsky, of course, was known as the ideological leader of the Ukrainian party of socialist revolutionaries, both during the revolution and afterward in the interwar period. It was also in the UNF library that I used the American magazine Ovid, in which Volodymyr Doroshenko's valuable literary portrait of Hrushevsky had appeared. Aside from rare periodicals, I was able to use several unique copies of rare books in the UNF library. Of these, the most important item was Simon Narizhny's Encyclopedic History of the Ukrainian Political Emigration in Central Europe Between the Wars. This book was richly illustrated, and I reproduced several rare photographs from it in my own book. One of these pictures was that of Hrushevsky, Dmitro Isayevich, and others at the Socialist Conference in Lucerne, Switzerland in 1919. It is interesting to note that in the 1990s, when he visited Toronto, Isayevich's son Yaroslav, an important scholar in his own right, approached me and excitedly told me that before the Gorbachev reform movement had got to Ukraine, the KGB had interrogated him on whether he had passed on this document to me during my brief trip to the Ukrainian SSR in 1981. Of course, I had gotten no such document out of the country at that time, and all the KGB inquiries were in vain. Isayevich himself pointed out to me that I had clearly acknowledged from where I had gotten the picture in the credits to my book. Still, he thought it important to let me know something of the effect that the publication of my book had had on the Soviet secret police. Finally, I also visited the library of the Ukrainian National Home, Ukrainsky Narodniki in Toronto. Although this was the oldest Ukrainian library that I used in Toronto, dating back to the pioneer period before 1920, it was the most poorly organized and difficult of access. Nevertheless, I was able to peruse its shelves, which were loaded with dusty old pamphlets of all kinds, and examine the annual almanacs of several Ukrainian-Canadian newspapers from the revolutionary years. From then, I was able to get a good feeling of how the Ukrainian colony in Canada greeted the events of 1917 to 18, the time of Hrushevsky's political apogee. Unfortunately, after the collapse of communism, the Toronto Ukrainian National Home Library was dissolved or dispersed, and its treasures are no longer available to interested researchers. I also made a research trip to Winnipeg, several in fact, and I'll spend a few, uh, a few minutes discussing the Ukrainian libraries in Winnipeg. Because I had pers close personal connections with Winnipeg, I was able to make good use of some Ukrainian libraries in that city. Until the 1970s, Winnipeg was widely known as the Ukrainian capital of Canada, and in the early 1980s, its library and archival facilities were quite extensive. Ukrainian scholars in Winnipeg were then able to use the University of Manitoba Library, the Library of St. Andrew's College, the Library of the Ukrainian Free Academy of Sciences in Canada, UVAN, the Library of the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Centre, the Library of the Prosvita Reading Society, and the very old and rich library of the Winnipeg Ukrainian National Home. In Winnipeg, my work on Hrushevsky was carried out primarily at the Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Centre, also Redok, which was organized during the Second World War by a number of UNF um, activists and which to the present remains the best organized and most easily accessible li private library in Winnipeg. The center, or Osoretic as it, calls for short, as it is called for short, possesses a rich collection of Ukrainian pamphlets and booklets from all periods during the 20th century, and I was able to discover a number of unique titles in its collection. One of the most interesting of these was a first-hand account by Ostap Voynarenko of the voting in the Central Narada during the Fourth Universal which proclaimed Ukrainian independence in early 1918. Wojnarenko was writing as a conservative opponent of the Rada, but his account shines as a document produced by actual participants in the events he describes. <clears throat> 
It was also at the center that I discovered a copy of Yevhen, Yevhen Chikolenko's invaluable, at that time, very rare diary, which described Ukrainian politics in Kiev before the revolution of 1917. Chikolenko was publisher of Kiev's daily newspaper, Rada, and his relations with Hrushevsky were quite close and fairly amicable. Entire letters from Hrushevsky to Chikolenko are reproduced in this diary. The center also produced and possessed a number of old journals and newspapers and other periodicals, which proved to be of use to me. An example of these was the rare and valuable Visnik of the Vienna-based Union for the Liberation of Ukraine. In 1916, a special issue was devoted to Hrushevsky, who was then living in exile in Moscow, where he was watched by the Tsar's police. I reproduced two interesting photographs from this issue in my section of illustrations. I made less use of other Winnipeg libraries, but without a doubt they contained considerable amount of material that would have been valuable to me. Unfortunately, at the beginning of the 21st century, both the Uvan Library and the Library of Prosvita Chitalnya, the Prosvita Reading Society, were dissolved the former even being shipped off to Ukraine for the use of patrons there. In the 1980s, however, I did visit the University of Manitoba Library, where I used several pre-1914 copies of the Zapiski of the Naukovoho Tovarisva Imena Shevchenko, an almost, complete set, an almost complete set of which was hardbound and sitting on the library shelves. Most North American libraries, if they had this periodical, only had it in microform which of course is more difficult to use. I also visited the St. Andrews College Library, a Ukrainian Orthodox institution affiliated with the University of Manitoba. In the St. Andrews College Library, I found a unique copy of Hrushevsky's fictional stories called Pizzoriane, Under the Stars, published in Kiev in 1928, but containing some of his earliest non-historical writings. Also, I eventually became acquainted with the Winnipeg scholar Mikhailo Maranchuk, an important figure in the Ukrainian Free Academy of Sciences of Canada, who earlier on had published some materials on Hrushevsky's relations with the Ukrainian colony here in Canada. On another level, at the bookstore of Trident Publishers, Trezuk in Winnipeg, I was able to purchase for my private library several old <coughs> items published in Winnipeg many years before, which turned out to be valuable to me, for, to me in my study of Hrushevsky. For example, I got an old copy of Dmitry Doroshenko's pre-revolution memoirs from uh, Trident Publishers. Uh, Doroshenko had written these memoirs at the urging of Olha Voitsenko, a Winnipeg Ukrainian activist, and they were first published serially in Ukrainsky Holos, a Winnipeg newspaper. Then I made a research trip to New York and Boston, and I'll say a few words about that. In 1981, I made an important research trip to New York and Boston in search of Hrushevsky materials. In New York, I made some use of the public library, the Slavonic collection of which is quite big, and boasts a complete uh, published catalog in many uh, large volumes. In this collection, I discovered published, the published but little known diary of Hrushevsky's rival for the leader of the party, Ukrainian party of socialist revolutionaries, Nikita Shapoval. Although less extensive than the parallel diary of Chikolenko, this diary contains several direct references to Shapoval's relations with the great historian, and they illuminate a different part of his life. Similarly, I used the collection of published and archival materials at Columbia University. I was able to acquire some rare pamphlets dealing with the revolution, and learned about the, live, the memoirs of Volodymyr Vinichenko, stored at Columbia but later on I was able to use these in published form. Vinichenko's diary is remarkable for its bitter references to Hrushevsky, but together with the diaries of Chikolenko and Shapoval forms an interesting primary base for further considerations of his career. As to diaries in general, which are always written as the events themselves transpire, rather than years later, they are generally a base that is more reliable than the memoir material written long after the events in question. Finally, I also visited the library of the Ukrainian Free Academy of Sciences in the US, Uvan, located in New York. One of the elderly female librarians there had actually known Hrushevsky in Kiev in the 1920s, 
and had served him in the library of the all, all Ukrainian, at the, the um, library of the Pan Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, just as she was now serving me at Uvan in New York. The group of scholars working at Uvan, which like his counterpart in Winnipeg, was founded by immigrants from central Ukraine after the Second World War, was quite distinguished and responsible for publishing some original material on Khrushchevsky. Perhaps the most important such manuscript was the memoir of Yevgeny Chikolenko, which retold and expanded upon the story told earlier in his diary. But one of the most eminent Uvan scholars, Alexander of Lublin, a scholar originally from Kiev, actually had known Hrushevsky personally in the 1920s, and on the pages of Ukrainsky Historic summed up his evaluation of the historian's role in Ukrainian political and intellectual life. Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to meet Oklahoma during my short research trip to the United States, but I later heard that he re eventually read and liked my dissertation on Hrushevsky. However, while I was in New York, I did visit the Shevchenko Scientific Society building where I hoped to use the library. Unfortunately, the institution was then in the process of moving, and I was not able to do that. On the other hand, I did meet and interview Dr. Vasil Lev, a prominent uh, Shevchenko Society scholar who had been active in the society in Galicia between the wars. Lev, a specialist on Ukrainian philology, told me of the society's traditions and Hrushevsky's role in them. We also discussed Hrushevsky's view on language. From New York, I passed on to Boston and the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, where I was welcomed by Omelian Pritsak, and discussed with him his famous article criticizing Hrushevsky. Although it was clear that Pritsak disagreed with Hrushevsky's historical methodology and political positions, it also seemed to be clear, in some strange way, that Pritsak had enormous respect for the man which did not come out at all in his article. Prasak suggested to me that I should spend an hour or so every morning reading Khrushchevsky's great ten-volume Historia Ukraine Russe, and this way go through the whole set in preparation for my biography. As I already had my hands full going through the hundreds of his political, polemical, and literary articles, as well as the many hundreds of articles about him, and I knew that his historical style did not exactly make for easy reading, especially in the Ukrainian original, I thought this suggestion to be quite impractical and quietly ignored it. But Pritsak did turn out to be quite helpful. He arranged for me to stay at Harvard for a full week in the Ukrainian Research Institute guest room and ensured that my stay was comfortable and academically profitable. At Harvard, I discovered Xerox copies of many uh, important pu pamphlets published during the, during the revolution. And I also used Soviet materials from the 1920s and 1930s that had not been available to me in Toronto. Of course, there were then several other great library collections in the United States which contained rich Ukrainian materials, but I was not able to use uh, most of these. Mention should be made, however, of the great collection of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., of which I was able to make some use through the interlibrary loan system. And the University of Illinois at Cham Urbana-Champaign, where Dmitro Stochen had for many years overseen an extensive collection of Ukrainica. The latter institution for many years ran a summer workshop which made the collection especially easy of access to researchers, and at present is of considerable use to visitors from Ukraine. As to the interlibrary loan system in general, I obtained some important books through this system from the libraries that I briefly visited during my various research trips. One of these was the, the uh, anti-Ukrainian tract by the Kiev censor and czarist bureaucrat S.N. Shigolov. This doc document was a kind of police handbook on the pre-revolution Ukrainian national movement in the Russian Empire but nevertheless was of great use in outline, outlining the history of this movement and reflecting how the Tsar's officials viewed it. Its characteristic characterization of Hrushevsky as heresiarch, ruler of the heretics, was particularly pointed. I photocopied copied this book from a unique collection obtained from the Columbia University Library in New York City. Finally, I did make a trip to Europe and I'll say a few words about that. 
I should mention that I did take, make a trip to, to Europe, including Soviet Ukraine, where I visited several libraries in search of Hrushevsky materials. Unfortunately, however, when I visited Ukraine, as I had expected, it was made very clear to me that Hrushevsky was completely off limits to researchers. I had expected better of Western <coughs> Europe, but even in the West, I was very disappointed to learn that all of the great private Ukrainian libraries in Western Europe were destroyed or disrupted during the war, and much, if not all, of their collections were, were also dispersed and destroyed. I already knew that this was true of the Ukrainian libraries in Berlin, Prague, and Warsaw, but I was surprised to find out that this was also true of the Petlura Library in pa Paris, where I had hoped to find some old published materials and also perhaps some archival materials. This was not to be, however, since the Nazis confiscated the original collection during their occupation of France in the 1940s, and so I was told at the time most of it was destroyed or disappeared. Thus, Western Europe was not much better for my purposes than Soviet Ukraine itself. In all of Europe, both West and East, the only library where I was able to find and use rare and unknown Hrushevsky materials was the Ossolineum Library in Wrocław, Poland. This was because when I made my trip to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union in 1981, only in Poland were political conditions suitable for primary research on a Ukrainian subject as controversial as Hrushevsky. This summer of 1981, I should add, was the springtime of the Solidarity Movement in Poland. Martial law was only imposed during the following winter. At the Oslineum, which was a major Polish research library that had been transferred from Lviv to Wrocław in 1945, I was able to obtain several rare pamphlets on Hrushevsky and on Ukrainian life in Old Galicia, where the library had once been located. These materials, which consisted primarily of various Polish criticisms of Hrushevsky's his history and politics, were then unavailable in the West. And finally, some conclusions. During the course of three solid years of working on absolutely nothing but Hrushevsky, I discovered that even during the height of the Cold War, it should, recall, it should be recalled that it was while I was beginning work on Hrushevsky that the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, it was entirely possible to carry out a major research project on a controversial Ukrainian subject that was politically proscribed in the Soviet Union. I was able to do this almost entirely on the basis of library and archival materials in North America. Moreover, the great bulk of this research was carried on entirely at my home university, the University of Toronto, or alternatively, at private Ukrainian libraries located elsewhere in Toronto and to some degree in Winnipeg. Research trips to New York and Boston were valuable in expanding my source base and filling out a few details, but the general picture was drawn on the basis of materials found here in Toronto. Of course, there were several limits to the kind of research that I could undertake. In North America, firstly, Despite the riches of the Robarts Library and the Ukrainian libraries in Toronto and Winnipeg, many important political pamphlets and journal and newspaper articles, including several by Hrushevsky himself, remain beyond my reach. This was especially true of rare political pamphlets and newspapers produced during the revolution of 1917 to 18. Secondly, archival materials on Hrushevsky were then, as now, almost completely non-existent in the West. And Soviet Ukrainian archives which I suspected to be quite rich, remained closed to me. With regard to archival materials, I might add that I was, in fact, only able to use a few unpublished items dealing with Hrushevsky and the Ukrainian Canadians, which were stored at the public archives in Canada. These materials did, however, throw considerable light upon Hrushevsky's political positions during the short period that he spent in immigration. In general, however, and this is the last paragraph, it can be said that my biographical study of Hrushevsky, a political biography as I had planned it and as it in fact turned out, which I believed at the time to be in the first of, the, of its kind in any language, and indeed in some ways was unique, was produced almost entirely on the basis of published materials. My principal pet task had been the collection and ordering of these materials and the writing of a sensible, sensible and attractive narrative. I am content 
that I was able to codify and synthesize the materials then available into the book that I finally published on the eve of the collapse of communism and the emergence of an independent and freer Ukraine. And this was done, I reiterate, on the basis of books and libraries here in Canada and in the United States. I have two questions. One relates to the relationship between uh, Vinnychenko and Brushevsky. I mean, they supposedly both were left leaning. Uh, I, I find it, I, I read it in Vinnychenko's introduction and Nazi, but I don't remember the details what he said about Brushevsky there, but why were they, in fact, uh, what was the antagonism revolving around? Yeah. Um, well, there are two reasons for conflict between Vinichenko and uh, Brzezinski. The first was political. Vinichenko was a member of the Social Democratic Party. Brzezinski was not. Brzezinski was the leader of the Socialist Revolutionaries. The Social Democrats tended to be urban-looking and uh, focused on workers. The socialist revolutionaries were oriented towards the peasantry. Most Ukrainians were peasants, and the SRs, socialist revolutionaries, had a majority in the Central Rada. That was the first difference. The second is personality. Ruszewski had a very difficult personality. Although in theory he was a democrat, open-minded, believed in democracy, equality, all those things, in his personal life he had a lot of autocratic characteristics. He was short-tempered, he was intolerant of, of uh, contributions to the national cause in which he had not participated, and uh, there was a certain amount of jealousy towards uh, others. Now I don't want to paint too negative a picture of him, because you have to recall, and although this is said by many people, that. Khrushchevsky had a difficult personality, it was hard to get along with, you know, and that sort of thing, short-tempered. There were reasons for it. Khrushchevsky was a symbol of the Ukrainian national movement. He was constantly being attacked by Russian nationalists, by Polish nationalists, by fellow Ukrainians, by all kinds of people. And it, got, it just wore away at his nerves all the time, and that was part of the reason why he was short-tempered. So I think those are the two reasons for the differences between Vinichenko and Khrushchevsky. I have another question. Sure. Okay. Yes, I'll say that. I think we will. I, I don't see the other hand at the moment. Would you, is there anything after the collapse of the Soviet Union that uh, has contains new and different material from Ruszewski? And have you had a chance to pick, look at these holdings which supposedly are now accessible? Oh yes, there's an enormous, enormous uh, amount of material that has come out. Um, Khrushchevsky's memoirs, for one thing. Uh, we didn't even know these existed when I wrote my book. But uh, they're quite extensive. They cover most of his life. And um, they're new. And then, of course, there's his letters. There's collections of literally thousands of Khrushchevsky letters uh, scattered all over Ukraine and Russia. And these are were completely unknown in the 1980s when I, when I uh, did my uh, research. So yes, there's an, and then of course there's the police archives, you know, which are extensive. So all of these things are, are there and they're now open, uh, at least in Ukraine, they're open to researchers and some of, them, some of the materials are already published. So yes, a lot of progress has been made since I wrote my book. This is a, a memoir about times past. This is times past. <laughs> um, there are. Pro I, I've thought about that. Um, the work was translated into Ukrainian, in a Ukrainian paraphrase, and published, serialized in the journal Sesvit in the 1990s, the very year that Ukraine declared state independence. Um, but it's a paraphrasing translation. It's not a complete translation. A complete translation uh, would be valuable in a way because it would give the reader an idea of what we knew about Khrushchevsky before the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
what were the, at least what we could find about Krushevsky. It wasn't known at all until I did it because nobody, nobody bothered. Um, but um, the times have changed and uh, the situation has changed. Any other questions? Yes, Andrei Huku. <coughs> Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, as you were doing your research, did you find, you know, when you were telling people at various uh, libraries or archive about uh, you were re researching uh, Rushevsky, did you get a different response according to, uh, I guess, the political uh, outlook of the sponsoring organization of a community library, or even the generational, like pre-World War, pre-Second World War origin? versus uh, post-Second World War, or post-Second World II, uh, War II. Yeah. Actually, I think that's a very good question. Um, answering that question would not only tell us about knowledge about Hrushevsky, but also the evolution of political life among the Ukrainians living here in the West over the entire 20th century. And the political opinions changed greatly, as uh, historians uh, often point out. And this was reflected in the various Ukrainian institutions I visited and the materials that I used. Um, some institutions, people were uh, fascinated that I was actually tackling Hrushevsky, this giant of, of Ukrainian uh, national life. Um, at Uvan in New York, they were quite impressed. Uh, Professor Omelchenko, I think his name was, was quite impressed that I was doing this. The elderly Ukrainian librarian who knew Hrushevsky and served him in Kiev in the 1920s uh, was also impressed. Um, by contrast, uh, at the UNF library here in Toronto, uh, there was a, a different attitude. Some people at the library uh, were interested in my project and supported me quite strongly. But I remember one person in particular um, who basically thought that Hrushevsky was, you know, a socialist and a pacifist who would wreck the Ukrainian National Revolution and uh, we have to go on to more tough-minded uh, nationalism. And of course this reflects the, the evolution of Ukrainian thought throughout the 20th century. Before the revolution, the Ukrainian national movement, so far as I can see, was overwhelmingly left-leaning. Why? Because they were faced with very conservative regimes who were their opponents, the Russian Empire, ultra-reactionary, and to some degree, the Habsburg monarchy, which was a very conservative institution as well. So the Ukrainian national movement, which was opposed to those things and trying to form its own its own, its own polity, I won't say state right off, bat, off the bat, but its own polity, was quite naturally left-leaning. After the revolution, when the Bolsheviks came to power, what were they faced with? They were faced with a regime that claimed to be left-wing, communist. So quite naturally, the opposition turned right. In the 1920s, the Ukrainian national movement veered sharply from the left to the right. And that's when you had the rise of the Ukrainian military organization, the OUN, the OUN, and all that sort of thing. And the institutions here in Canada reflect that. The um, old um, uh, Ukrainian national home, an old, old institution, that lurist, you know, uh, filled with all of these dusty old pamphlets and things like that that I wish were still there, you know, the real treasures. Uh, left over from the 19, uh, from the revolution itself and from the 1920s. And I, I met several elderly gentlemen there. And of course, they, they reflected that, those old opinions to some degree. And then the UNF reflects the opinions of the interwar immigration, which turned to the right. Uh, the St. Vladimir's Library, which uh, was affiliated with the Orthodox Church, um, um, not affiliated, but established by Orthodox Church members, uh, tended to be more open towards Ruszewski, I thought. Uh, why? Because the, uh, those, those activists were more moderate and Canadian-oriented in their politics than was the UNF. And so they were more open towards Ruszewski, who was on the left rather than
So yes, um, there, there were different attitudes at different Ukrainian institutions, and I ran into them in my uh, research on Hrushevsky. By the way, uh, this um, Ivan Maku, who published this magnificent uh, memoir of Ukrainian life in Galicia, is no relation to Andrei Maku, who is sitting in this, <laughs> this evening. It's like the door And then there's the two door shampoo. So. And we have been, I'll take a chance for a question. Uh, in a certain degree, uh, the emigration was a time war. Uh, that is, uh, the Ruchevsky Institute in Edmonton, which was, what was the name of what is today the St. John's Institute uh, for a number of decades, and it's high after 1918, in many ways reflected Ruchevsky as the symbol of the national movement. Uh, and I think the left-right paradigm doesn't really fit entirely for the visions of some of these people. That is, he was the Ukrainian leader in many ways. And that, I think, remained on in a certain way until the later immigrations uh, uh, changed it or began to change it. Uh, and I think also represents a, a great differentiation. Then uh, my question is, uh, uh, you didn't tell us very much about the responses of your professors. That is, you said that there were varying views of Ruzhensky when you started the project. Uh, how were they reflected in the time of your research? And uh, to what degree did you change their views? Um, that, I think, is a difficult question for me to answer. Um, my supervisor was Peter Brock. His view uh, was uh, largely uh, that of the people that he studied, uh, which was primarily uh, Poles. And his view of East Central Europe, I think, was molded by people like Halecki and that sort of thing. Uh, although he even differed from Halecki insofar as he saw most of Ukraine as being part of the Polish orbit rather than the Russian orbit. So um, I'm not sure that my dissertation changed his views on that at all, but I don't really know. Um, another very important professor was John Keep, who is still with us. He lives in Switzerland, and I correspond with him regularly. Um, his view was uh, that of a uh, more, uh, more Ru Russo-centric uh, view. Why? Because he was a Russian historian. He had studied Muscovy and that sort of thing. Uh, and he studied uh, the history of the Bolshevik Party, the, so the uh, Social Democratic Party in Russia and that sort of thing. I think his view was changed. Uh, I think he, he opened up quite a bit after reading my, my thesis, um, which he greatly admired. He wrote me a note after the thesis defense in which he stated that this thesis was the best thesis he had seen at the University of Toronto in his 13 years at the university up to that point. Um, also on the committee was Professor Magachi, who can probably speak for himself better than I can speak for him. Uh, he can tell us whether um, my view changed his in any, in any way. I don't know whether it did or not. Um, well, there was nothing to change. I had great respect for Kuchewski. <laughs> and uh, when I was asked once a question, as these things happen from time to time among colleagues or anybody, who uh, you know, asked a kind of simplistic popular question, who's the most famous Ukrainian? And my response, and I think, was who's the most famous Ukrainian in the 20th century? And my response rather quickly was, actually, I would say two. One, Mikhail Kuchevsky, and the other, Metropolitan Andrzej Sheptycki. 
you had done this biography of Fushevsky and then fulfilled the need to have him represented in the literature. And then a few years after that, I organized this international conference and we produced not a monograph by a single author as yours, but nonetheless, the first standard study of uh, Shevtitsky. So uh, I didn't need, my views didn't need to be changed by your dissertation, your dissertation and then the book sim simply confirmed the need to bring these two outstanding figures to the larger scholarly world. And if I may, since I've now been asked, without my even asking, a, a short question, which is somewhat related to the role that you have played in bringing Rushevsky, or putting order in the light of Rushevsky uh, back at the time that you did, to what degree did your work, or any of our work, have an impact on the larger scholarly community? And now specifically in your case. There are often studies, usually collected studies, of the great historians uh, who are simultaneously nationality makers or nation makers or national awakeners. And we have names like Palatsky and Nikolai Yorga, etc. Since you wrote your work, were you ever contacted or requested by fellow colleagues to, for instance, in volumes of this kind, or even in encyclopedic works, contribute a piece on Shkushevsky? Or is he still, in the larger world, or relatively, in the larger Western world that is, or for that matter, non-Ukrainian European world, still a relatively little known figure? Um, that's a big question, um, because, of the, uh, because of the two parts. First, there's the part about Ukrainian scholarship in general <coughs> and its influence on the wider Ukrainian, uh, the, the wider academic community, especially here in North America. And secondly, my dissertation, my book on Ryshevsky. The first part, um, sad to say, I had the feeling that throughout the Cold War, uh, Ukrainian scholarship was operating in isolation. Uh, and had very little impact on the wider academic community. Very little. Um, there were, of course, some great scholars among uh, the Ukrainian uh, academics in the West. You know, Dmitry Chizhevsky uh, in Germany, George Lutsky here in Toronto, uh, others elsewhere. Um, Insofar as they wrote in English, I think they had some influence. For example, Lutsky. Un unlike many of his colleagues, Lutsky produced an enormous number of books in English on Ukrainian literature. And uh, I think they had some impact. Those who wrote in Ukrainian had virtually none. I think in particular of Ukrainsky Historic, the historical journal that, uh, that uh, I use so extensively. It was useful to me because I could, use, uh, I could read Ukrainian and its material was directly on the subject in which I was working. Beyond me, beyond this fellow circle of fellow Ukrainian scholars, I think the impact was virtually negligible. So that's the Cold War. Um, today, I think Ukrainian studies are far greater, to a far greater degree, are in, integrated into the general academic scheme of things. There are large numbers of non-Ukrainians uh, taking courses on Ukraine, studying Ukraine, and I think these people are 
having an impact. For some of your students, for example, are having an impact uh, beyond the, the narrow circle of Ukrainian scholarship. So that has changed. Uh, with regard to my book in particular, the reviews were excellent. Most of the reviews were, were, were pretty good, at least the, those appearing in languages other than English. For example, Andrzej Jemba published a very, very good and lengthy review in Poland. Andreas Kapler published a very positive review in uh, Historische Zeitschrift, the most prestigious German historical periodical in uh, Germany. And uh, Dimitrician, Basil Dimitrician, published a very positive review in the United States. But most of the reviews, and this su surprised me enormously, most of the reviews of Fershevsky, published in English, were very, very tepid, very, very cautious, and I would say in many cases, refused to take a stand on the issues that I discussed. In other words, was Hrushevsky truly a great man or not? What about Hrushevsky's politics? Was it positive or not? Where was Hrushevsky's place in the, in the wider scheme of, of, of scholarship? Where was Hrushevsky's place in the, in, in the history of the Ukrainian national movement? So many scholars, and including some of the leading lights of Ukrainian historical scholarship here in the West, I'd say, were very, very cautious to the point of uh, timidity in, in discussing my, my work. Why that was, I don't know. Dimitrician wasn't like that. And there was one very uh, negative review published in Ukrainsky Historic by Bohdan Klied, uh, who criticized me for not going into detail on Hrushevsky's historiography. Okay, that's fine, and I respect that. He took a position. But what about those many other reviewers who refuse to take a position? To this day, I don't understand why. Yeah, I think we've reached the point now, and, and to segue into uh, the presentation, uh, one of the reasons uh, studies on Ukraine are much better known is that the University of Toronto Press uh, has uh, done a remarkable job over the past few decades of putting out books on Ukraine. I can say that even though we represent the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies Press, but when you look at where Ukrainian studies were in publication, the publication world 30 years or 40 years ago, and where it is now, uh, what we'll call night and day to be, be that is, but certainly the fact that so many monographs have been published on Ukraine and the University of Toronto Press has been a leader in it. And I would then ask, uh, ask us to go on to our presentation of Gathering a Heritage, Ukrainian, Slavonic, and Ethnic Canada in the U.S. Uh, in, in, from the University of Toronto Press. And uh, you are yes, listed on the presentation, so that you can give us a... Okay, I have... Uh, there were three funders who made possible this particular book. This is not the book on Hrushevsky, by the way. This is the one you saw in front, my most recent product. Um, there's a variety of essays in this book, all kinds of things. Uh, but in general, the book is uh, unlike other uh, books on uh, Canadian ethnic history, insofar as it, it reaches the top. It's about high culture. It's about scholarship. It's about historians, that sort of thing, and the uh, political elite, and not uh, what's happening on the farms or in the factories or this sort of thing. So there, there's this is kind of an elitist history in a way, it's an it's a intellectual history in a way, a political history in a way. And it's different in that sense, I think, from a lot of the books that you see on Ukrainian Canadian history. And the three funders were the um, Ukrainian Fund at Harvard, um, the uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society, and the C Canadian Foundation for Ukrainian Studies. And I'm very thankful to all three of these institutions. And if the relative representatives come up, I would like to present copies of each of these. First two. two. Yeah, okay. Go out in the picture time. So oh, okay. I mean, we have to get ready. Yeah, let me take them all out of the box here. That is good. Picture time.
first of all, to uh, Kylie Derevich here, three copies for the Shevchenko Scientific Society. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> Would you just face this way, please? Okay. And three copies for the Canadian Foundation. Thank you, Thank you very much. It would, have been, would not have been possible. <laughs> to encourage you to get to the back table and to purchase a copy of this book. Our author will be pleased to sign this book for you. Uh, you can see he has a great knowledge of the history of the Ukrainians in Canada and in North America. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, he as well uh, will present you with a very varied world intellectually, a diverse world. Uh, uh, of what is Ukrainian society uh, in North America. And uh, we are grateful to him uh, for, as I said, having such a great panoply of interests that he brings together. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.